Dr. Kittos, and I'd like to uh, welcome you and stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really delighted for the opportunity to present today and thank you for that very kind introduction. So let's dive in. Humanism in the care of the advanced heart failure patient. What is humanism? Well, humanism has a lot of definitions. Um, I think devotion to human welfare, uh, being emphasizing an individual's dignity and worth is a very important definition that's relevant to our discussion. So humanism in the care of the advanced heart failure patient. Well, what is advanced heart failure? This picture really shows it really well. If you look at the top, it gives you a patient's quality of life over time, and at the bottom, intensity of care. So when someone is initially diagnosed with heart failure, they'll have poor quality of life that improves with medical therapy. But then there is this progressive decline where patients reach that gray zone, where they're transitioning to advanced heart failure, where their oral therapies are failing. And it's a time for many major medical decisions like mechanical circulatory support or MCS, transplant, palliative care, defibrillator, de defibrillator deactivation, or hospice. And when you have a patient with advanced heart failure, it's important to recognize that the stakes are high. Let's think about patients with advanced heart failure who present for consideration of a left ventricular assist device or LVAD. Maybe they're declined for consideration. Those who are declined for psychosocial reasons, maybe poor adherence to medical therapy or lack of caregiver support have a one-year survival of 64%. Those who are declined for medical contraindications have a one-year survival of 42%. So when I care for my patients with advanced heart failure, I recognize that there are so many stressors, so many issues to discuss because the medical stakes are high and their prognosis can be very poor. It's important to remember, however, that humanism is a data-free zone and no PubMed citations were harmed in the making of this presentation. When we think about the levels of evidence we think about in medicine, multiple randomized controlled trials, non-randomized registry studies, well, when I'm gonna to talk to you about humanism, I'm really talking about consensus opinion of exports, or in my case, my personal experience. And you might have heard the phrase that the plural of anecdote is not data. Well, I'm going to be sharing a lot of anecdotes with you. I'm going to be telling you a lot of stories about my patients and what I learned from them. And while the plural of anecdote isn't data, some might say the plural of anecdote is Twitter for better or for worse, but I'd like to say that the plural of anecdote is experience. And if I'm sharing my quote unquote expert opinion with you, it's based on experience. And I love this quotation that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So some of the stories I will share with you on my journey to humanism and advanced heart failure comes from my own bad judgment, but that's okay because ultimately you should learn from other people's mistakes because life is too short to make them all yourself. So here we go. I'm going to share with you some of my mistakes, some of my bad judgment on the road to good judgment from experience. So when I focus on humanism and advanced heart failure, I wanna focus on things that apply to our patients, our colleagues and ourselves. And I think what you'll find is some of these lessons that I have learned through caring for patients with advanced heart failure could apply to any part of medicine or perhaps for life in general. So let's focus on patients. What do I wanna tell you about humanism when it comes to patients with advanced heart failure? I wanna to talk to you about tough discussions. How do you have have those difficult discussions with patients and how do we see things from the patient's perspective. So I have a stepwise approach to pretty much everything in medicine, the system that I follow. And the system that I have devised for having tough discussions with patients is step one to share the medical facts, 
Step two, to explicitly explain the decisions that patients will have to make. And step three is to end every tough discussion with a promise. So let's talk about the medical facts. I mean, we don't wanna use any medical jargon. I like to tell my trainees, pretend you're talking to your best friend who is not in the medical arena and explain things more than once. I have a feeling that when patients get bad news, some of what they hear is just a roaring sensation in their head of being completely overwhelmed. So I like to repeat the key phrases again and again to make sure to add that sense that they're absorbing what I'm saying, at least to some extent. When it comes to making decisions, I like to outline the options very clearly, offer best and worst case scenarios. For example, if a patient is admitted to the hospital in cardiogenic shock, I'll say to them, the best case scenario is that we're completing an evaluation to assess your candidacy for heart transplantation. And the best case scenario is we'll find no red flags. You're a fantastic candidate. We'll put you on the list and you'll get a transplant. But we have to talk about the worst case scenario because even if I don't mention it, I know you're thinking about it. And the worst case scenario is we might find a red flag that makes transplant too risky or not a good option for you, or you might not survive on the way to transplant. And then I'd say, and there's every, patients always have a choice. Do they wanna proceed with the evaluation? Do they not? And so I'll say to them, I'll, I'll model decision-making in that some people would choose in your situation to move forward as long as the medical team believes there's hope of a good, recovery, let's keep doing everything. However, I've had some patients who say that the idea of a transplant is too much for them to bear and they're willing to accept the risk of not surviving. Given these options, what feels right to you? And that's the start of the conversation. And I end always with a promise that I will be honest if things aren't going well, and I will never ask you or your family to make medical decisions. And I think that's so important. I tell patients they're the boss of their bodies. I'm the medical consultant, but I know all the medical facts and they know what feels right to them. So together we'll come to a consensus, but they never bear the burden of responsibility of medical decision-making. I delineate the options that are medically reasonable. That's not their job. So let me go through some stories now about times that I didn't do things well. I published this essay in um, Academic Medicine a few years ago, uh, my first terrible diagnosis. So when I was in medical school, I, I love medical school. I, I love memorizing things. I was really good at memorizing things. And I loved collecting all these facts and I couldn't wait to be on the clinical rotations and apply the facts to my patients. I loved knowing that um, haloperidol was contraindicated in Parkinsonism because it's a dopamine antagonist. You know, I loved knowing that uh, keratinemia would turn your skin yellow, but not your sclera, as opposed to jaundice. I, I, these facts were very exciting to me. I felt like every time I diagnosed a patient, I was getting an ANA test. But I failed to recognize the patient behind the diagnosis until one day I was in urgent care on a rotation as a fourth year medical student, and a patient came in with a uh, lump she noticed in her breast. And as soon as I uncovered her gown, I saw the skin was hot and red. She had that classic peau d'orange dimpling of the skin. And I knew right away that this was an awful breast cancer. And it, it hit me for the first time that just because I knew the right answer, that wasn't a good thing for the patient. And so I, you know, I said I'd always relished getting the right answer instead of thinking about the patient behind the answer. And this scenario allowed me to see both sides of a diagnosis. When this patient came to see me uh, and my attending physician as a fourth year medical student, we told her it could be an infection or something else and set her up for further testing. We didn't address the elephant in the room and I, I never asked my attending why. But the other thing I learned from this was when I make an awful discovery, I offer patients an honest differential diagnosis. I go through the best worst, best case and worst case scenarios. I acknowledge we, they have more questions than answers, but we'll make a plan to get the answers. 
So that's the first issue, tough discussions. I think the next issue that's so important to keep in mind is seeing things from the patient's perspective. And I wrote another really interesting um, essay a few years ago in JAMA Cardiology. It was called 142 Days. And that was how long one of my patients stayed in the hospital while he awaited a heart and liver transplant. And in this article, uh, there were three authors. And there was me, the attending physician, my fellow, and the patient himself. We all contributed a portion to say what did those 142 days feel like for us. My fellow uh, said his safe passage to transplant was my responsibility. I think he sensed this and eased my anxiety during afternoon chats. The attending said me, I felt that as I walked out of the room, I would give myself a mental shake considering how to provide the right balance of tempered optimism and managed expectations to the patient next door and the 15 patients after that. And how did it feel like to the patient those 142 days? They felt that they were constantly reading facial extract expressions, looking for reasons to worry, but the physicians all had the same game faces, their optimism and confidence, however unrealistic, were a constant anchor. And the revelation to me from this piece, trying to see things from the patient's perspective, was recognizing that in a way we were all trying to comfort each other, and that shared comfort was actually beneficial to all of us. So when I thought about my conversations with this patient and many others, I realized the importance of framing medical options by goals and values and preferences. So there's the wrong way and I think a better way. So the wrong way, we could do CPR on your mom if you want. That puts an unacceptable burden on a patient's family. Rather, your mom is sick, CPR, CPR may keep her alive longer, but not achieve the quality of life she said she wanted. So focusing not on the medical option, but on what the goals, values, and preferences of the patient might be. You're in renal failure. We need to start dialysis. Again, that really doesn't give the patient the spectrum of options. It might be better to say your kidneys have failed, again, no medical jargon. Some patients don't want dialysis and live a few weeks. Others choose dialysis, but may still only live a few months. Let's talk about what's right for you, opening the door to options and discussion. Or because of your obesity and advanced diabetes, you can't have a heart transplant. Again, that really treats the patient in a sense that their medical condition has a punitive outcome. It might be better and more realistic to say, given your medical issues of obesity and advanced diabetes, a heart transplant would not achieve our goal of helping you feel better and live longer. Let's talk about what could. So not, not closing a door, but opening a conversation. So that's what I wanted to talk about when we talk about humanism with our patients. But I think it's important to focus on how we can employ humanism in our interactions with colleagues as well. No matter what field you are in in medicine, it's a team sport. Certainly in advanced heart failure, we work as cardiologists, we have our surgeons, our pharmacists, our nutrition workers our nutritionists, our social workers, our physical therapists, and the myriad of other consultants in the liver, kidney, lung, infectious disease realm. There are so many people that work together to promote the health and well-being of our patients. So we have to take care of not just our patients, but we have to take care of our team. And so I want to talk about the advice I give fellows who train with me and how I handle those calls and requests. So I, I've been uh, active on Twitter and I like to post polls on Twitter. And so I'm gonna give you one of my polls on Twitter. Um, I, I, I have these things called Kittleson rules where I, I post my rules for best patient care. And so at the start of fellowship, what do I tell new fellows I expect from them? Be nice and work hard, read a lot and don't complain, talk fast and don't order too many tests. Well, it turned out we had a good turnout for this poll. Uh, over a thousand people responded and most of them got it right. It is truly the case that the first thing I tell new fellows when I meet them is the only things we want from you 
is that you're nice and you work hard because that really encapsulates everything it means to be a good physician and a good person. And I, I'm, I'm going to share some uh, of my other tweets that pertain to this topic. A long ago mentor once said to me, strive to be known as a doc who is reliable and held in high esteem by the nursing staff. And I think that encompasses so much of what you need to be a great clinician and human being. Reliable, reliable means so much, doesn't it? It means you do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. If people can count on you, then you're doing things right. What, what about the nursing staff? You know, I say the docs are in the room for five minutes and drift away. The nurses are with the patients all day and the nurses see every medical team rotating in and out of the room. So the nurses often see the medical team at their best and at their worst. And I say, if, the, if whenever I get sent a patient referred to me by a nurse who's either a family member or a friend, I know I've done a good job because they see the day in and day out of how we treat colleagues and patients as medical staff. And speaking of being reliable, you know, my father was a uh, private practice internist and cardiologist for many decades, and he shared this with me, which I'm sure you've heard before, but the three A's, the three mo most important A's of being a, a medical professional, availability, affability, and ability in that order. Patients want you to be available, they want you to be nice, and they want you to know what you're doing. But if you're never available, they'll never know that you're nice and that you know what you're doing. And if you're not nice, they won't trust you to be, to know what you're, to judge your abilities. So if you have two consultants of equal skill, one that reliably relays their recommendations and responds to questions, one that ignores emails and calls, needs to be tracked down in person, who do you want to be? Who are you more likely to call? So be the doctor that reliably relays recommendations and responds to questions because that timely communication is not only necessary for great care, but it's a wonderful way to care for your colleagues. We all have been in that situation where we need to track down a doc and we know that the doc we need to track down as someone who's impossible to get a hold of. Already there's more stress in your day, stress that doesn't need to be there. So don't put that stress on other people. Be the reliable, available person. And then handling calls. You know, I was one of those residents who loved every minute of patient care and learning, but disliked every minute of being awake in the middle of the night. My sleep was my very important to me. And so I would answer calls often in a unfriendly manner. And that wasn't the right thing to do. And I had an epiphany once. Um, so on night call, I used to answer every page with what's the emergency. But I needed on an on-call pediatrician one night for my sick kid. And his first words were, how can I help? And that was a revelation to me to be battling that middle of the night phone tree, pressing all the buttons to be put on hold with the answering service, waiting for the doctor call or waiting for the doctor call back and hoping the phone doesn't ring too loud and disturb everyone else in the house. And then the pediatrician's first words, how can I help? It just was a release of relief that someone was out there wanting to help me. And it was a revelation also that when I started answering the phone with how can I help instead of what's the emergency, the whole tone of that middle of the night conversation was so different, so much better for both of us. And I realized that not being nice as I had been did never limited the calls. It just made them more unpleasant for everyone involved. So another great way to take care of our colleagues, in addition to rely, being reliable, to being available, is when you answer the phone, you answer it with something like, how can I help? And finally, humanism in the, in the care of ourselves, because it is a high stakes game. It is a high pressure game to care for patients when life and death are at stake. And it takes a toll on our colleagues and it takes a toll on us. 
So I want to give you my advice on processing bad outcomes and, and going through the life stages of our career trajectory. So we're all familiar, I think, with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, um, stages of bereavement, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, grief, acceptance. And I often wonder what is the trajectory of a doctor's grief? And I wrote this essay a few years ago in the Annals of Internal Medicine called The Privilege of Grief, where I go through the stages that I fashioned to help me deal with tragedy, patient tragedy. And the first step is separating fault from fluke. The second is distinguishing the unforeseen from the expected. And the third is accepting that control ultimately is an illusion. So let's talk about these in more detail. What do I mean by fault versus fluke? If a bad thing happens to a patient, you have to first figure out is it just because bad things happen or did you do something wrong? That's an extraordinarily important distinction to make and often takes conversations with trusted mentors and colleagues to come to that decision. And if you were at fault, you have to make peace ultimately, but recognize that you'll never make the same mistake twice. And if it was a fluke, you can't quote doctor by anecdote. For example, I had a patient once with severe aortic stenosis as well as left main uh, coronary artery stenosis from radiation induced cardiac, uh, cardiac disease. She needed to undergo a coronary angiogram to uh, as for preoperative guidance for her aortic valve replacement. This was about 15 years ago before coronary CT angiogram was as useful as it is today. So she went to the cath lab and she got sedation in preparation for the procedure, some midazolam and fentanyl. And then she had precipitous fall in her blood pressure and had an almost cardiac arrest. Not surprising, the vasodilation, the fall in blood pressure was not well tolerated given her aortic stenosis and left main coronary disease. But the physician who did her angiogram made a blanket decision following that he would never again give sedation to a patient undergoing an angiogram. And while that is technically possible, it's very uncomfortable for patients. He took a fluke in the sense that that one episode was to not be applied to every patient and he chose to doctor by anecdote. So I think it's important to guard against that in our patients where we don't treat everyone as the one situation that went badly. What about the expected for the un versus the unforeseen? I think that bad outcomes are horrible, but unforeseen outcomes are worse in the sense that you have to prepare patients for their worst case scenarios. I cared for a patient once who traveled across the country from the East Coast to California for a heart transplant evaluation because he'd been turned down by his local center as being a prohibitive risk. We felt he was acceptable and we listed him and he had a terrible outcome. He spent months in our intensive care unit before passing away. And while I don't, I feel that that was an acceptable outcome in the sense that it couldn't have been, it wasn't a medical error that made it happen. It was simply bad luck. I wish I had prepared him and his wife better for this terrible outcome. And I've been much more explicit in my discussions with patients since then about the bad things that can happen when you are listed for heart transplant. And finally, I think control is an illusion. And we have to remember that bad things will happen despite our best efforts. I'm not saying it's easy, but we need to grieve the bad judgment, but make peace with those bad outcomes. And let me give you an example about what I mean, differentiating bad judgment from bad outcomes. I think that's such a pivotal point to make when we're caring for patients. So this is based on another essay um, that came out a few years ago in JAMA Cardiology, where I compared two patients, Mr. R and Ms. S. Both were listed for heart transplant. Mr. R was listed as an outpatient. He wasn't that sick. He was actually working full time at the time he was listed. And post-transplant, he had some serious outcomes. He was on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for primary graft dysfunction. He had a tracheostomy, pancreatitis, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, resulting in toe amputations. 10 years later, he suffered from migraines related to the anti-rejection medicines, coronary vasospasm, which led to chest discomfort. 
He was on dialysis because of calcineurin inhibitor toxicity. And I worked up the courage one day to ask him, do you regret that you went through transplant? And he told me, no. He said, listen, I've had a hard course, but I've lived to see my son graduate from college. And that's what I always wanted. But, you know, I think the judgment might have been bad in that I'm not sure he was truly sick enough for transplant when he was listed. Contrast that with Miss S. She was listed as an inpatient. She was in cardiogenic shock and inotrope dependent. After transplant, she had multiple embolic strokes leading to aphasia and hemiparesis. A year after transplant, she could talk a little, she could walk with a cane, but she would never be the same. And when I asked her at that time, do you regret undergoing transplant? She said, yes, I don't want to live like this. But ultimately, the judgment to list her for transplant was the right one. She would have died without it. So you have two patients, both who had a bad outcome, but one who shouldn't, maybe shouldn't have been listed and one should, contrasting with one regretted it and one didn't. So how do you put it together? I like to stratify patient, my, what will I do in the future? Stratified by was the judgment good or bad and was the outcome good or bad? And here, Mr. R had a bad outcome and maybe I'll be more careful to list out patients for transplant, understanding the bad things that can happen. Miss S had a, good, a bad outcome and she regretted her transplant. But on the other hand, it was the right decision. In hindsight, it was still right to list her. So I wouldn't change my future judgment. So how do I think about this? I think medical decision-making is an enormous responsibility when we get it wrong. And even when we get it right, and as a person, uh, we can absorb the grief, anger, frustration of every tragedy, but as a physician, as we move forward, as we learn from our experience, we have to focus on changing our practice based on the questionable decisions, not the bad outcomes. So to tell you some more stories about how we should care for patients and care for ourselves, I'm gonna tell you about another uh, bad decision uh, that I think I made regarding a patient who was listed for transplant. This is an essay I published in the New England Journal a few years ago, going through how uh, we care for patients. And this was a patient for whom I made all the right medical decisions. He was sick, he was in cardiogenic shock, he needed a transplant. I ably navigated his insurance, his anotropic support, observed his end organ function, and he had a beautiful medical outcome. But I spent that entire time I cared for him in the hospital, never once speaking directly to him. And it wasn't until I met him in clinic when he was thriving that I spoke to him for the first time. And the reason was he was deaf and I never took the time in the hospital to track down a deaf translator, American Sign Language interpreter. I used his father as the interpreter. And while he never said anything, he seemed fine with it. His father seemed fine with it. I used that inertia, that excuse as my inertia, but really I fell into the complacency born of pragmatism and confidence in my abilities. I knew I was providing the best medical care, so I ignored the importance of direct communication and I got lucky because he did great. But if he had done poorly, I had neglected to establish a rapport with him where we could have had those tough dis discussions. And really what this taught me was that diseases may become routine with experience, but patients must not. So putting this all together, I think we have to recognize that when it comes to humanism, we care for our patients, we care for our colleagues, and we care for ourselves. And we'll deal with the out with the aftermath of difficult decisions, we'll deal with the outcomes and the aftermath of poor decisions, but ultimately we also have to celebrate the victories. And I wanted to share with you this, this poem I published uh, in JAMA called Mistakes. I keep the kind notes from grateful patients in my second desk drawer. For mistakes, I keep a mental file that replays on nights I can't sleep. The near misses, the misdiagnoses, the wrong decisions live there. Anxious, overweight, this neck, I almost didn't order the CT. Mitral valve prolapse, fatigue, and night sweats. 
and missed endocarditis. Cardiac sarcoid steroids or transplant? I chose wrong and she soon crashed. The stash of kind notes never sees the light, but the mental file stays fresh. Happy endings all alike, but every mistake cuts in its own way. And I think you've all been there as you care for patients. We focus so much more time on the mistakes than on the victories. So make sure to also celebrate the victories, bask in the right decisions that you make. And finally, when it comes to caring for ourselves, I think it's important to remember career trajectories. So sometimes I'm asked how I do it all with three kids and a career, and the answer is I don't. Career extras like research get put on hold when the family requires more attention. I always tell my trainees that life happens in stages. You're not supposed to accomplish it all at once. And as an exercise some years ago, I put together a graph of my PubMed citations by year. And I think it tells a really interesting story and a lot of good lessons. So here we have fellowship where, you know, I published some, I increased my productivity as I had research time. And then through early faculty, early career, there's a steady rise in what I'm doing. But then there's these three cliffs where I was doing well and then I dropped off a cliff. And in fact, those correspond to kid one, kid two, and kid three. So what does that tell us? It tells us it's okay to take breaks. It's also important to notice the red line here is when I'm senior or first author on publications. And you can see this vast expanse over my childbearing years where I was neither senior nor first author on any publication. It's okay to not love research. It's okay to put that on hold. And then you see the green line here well, the green line represents my foray into medical humanities and medical narratives and essays and poems. And I think what you have to remember is that life is long and it's more than okay to cultivate other passions. So we've gone through humanism and advanced heart failure, caring for patients, colleagues, ourselves. But there is the elephant in the room that I haven't covered, and that's COVID. So what has COVID taught us? And I'm gonna share with you three stories um, to illustrate the lessons I've learned from COVID. Uh, number one is um, based on an essay that I published early in the pandemic in New England Journal in April of 2020. And I tell the story of a patient who came to see me in March of 2020, before we were really thinking about COVID and he had chronic stable angina. And I said to him that you should be on medical therapy with a beta blocker, aspirin, a statin, come back and see me in a few weeks. If you still have angina, we can do an angiogram. And he said, I don't believe you that medications are enough. I need an angiogram. And I said, well, we'll schedule it. We'll put it on the schedule, but let's go by the guidelines from the American Heart Association, which indicate that medical therapy may be adequate to control your symptoms, which are stable. Two weeks later, when he had my follow-up appointment with me, the whole world had changed. My kids' schools had been shut down. We were in the midst of the, of the first wave, waiting with dread for what ha was happening in China and Europe to come over to America. And he said to me, please cancel that angiogram. I don't want to be anywhere near the hospital. My angina is better, and I don't want that angiogram done. It was such a reversal. And what it taught me was that overwhelmed by the anticipated harms of COVID, we have to remember that other diseases will continue to progress during the pandemic. And with all our patients, we'll have to ask a new question. What's the best approach to treating their disease? And how does our or their fear of COVID-19 affect the risk benefit calculus? The other difference is that I had my first telehealth appointment with him. And I felt that as we embrace our new ways of communicating with patients, we have to listen to their symptoms and also their fears and chart a course in the face of uncertainty. So this was very early in the pandemic. In the middle of the pandemic, I had another uh, fateful interaction with a patient who called my office and asked me to prescribe 
prophylactic hydroxychloroquine for him. He'd been my patient for over a decade. He had a stable cardiomyopathy, and he said he was afraid of what would happen to him if he got COVID, and he'd heard a recent press conference uh, by the president at the time stating that hydroxychloroquine was beneficial. I wouldn't give it to him because there was no evidence behind it, and he got very angry with me. And that was a revelation too. I realized that I had science on my side, but he had the fear of death on his. We could disagree on the best way to remain safe and still trust each other. It worked out that I explained to him why I wouldn't prescribe it, but I didn't minimize his fear. And we ended with him asking me, are we okay? And I thought that was really important because the fear and uncertainty strained our bond. It did not break it. He knew that I would not abandon him because we disagreed. And I now, as he's continued to see me, I think our trust is stronger. And that was a real lesson from COVID, factoring in patients' fears and trust into our conversations. And the final story I want to tell you is about a heart transplant recipient of mine who refused a COVID vaccination. She refused it because she was convinced it would harm her DNA. And I, it was very hard for us because I truly believed that it was the right thing for her. And at the time I saw her, she challenged me and said, well, when the vaccine comes out for kids, are you gonna vaccinate your kids? And it was quite early in the, in the process of vaccination of children where it hadn't been approved yet by the FDA, it hadn't been recommended by the CDC, we knew very little. And I, and I tried to balance for her the risk benefit equation for a transplant recipient with the risk benefit equation at the time with what we knew for healthy children. And it really struck me that we were battling a second pandemic, one of mistrust in the science that should have saved us. And, and she ended up dying of COVID-19. And I think she died not for the lack of life-saving interventions, but for the lack of trust in them. So I treat every conversation now with a vaccine-resistant patient as if it might be our last. And I explain, I apply the same standards to them as I do to my own family. And that if we can rebuild the trust in medicine, I believe we can implement the science that can save lives. And so I try to do this one patient at a time. So that's what I wanted to tell you. When it comes to uh, humanism in advanced heart failure, I, I love this wonderful quotation that the role of a physician is to cure sometimes, relieve often, comfort always, and I think with any talk, it never hurts to end a little early. So I'm happy now to uh, discuss with you uh, and go through any questions. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kittelson. I think this is, uh, this is one of the most important uh, discussions in, in, in medicine. Um, yeah, everyone, feel free to uh, write the questions. I will we'll try to um, direct them to Dr. Kittelson. So yeah, the um, more you practice medicine, you realize that you become uh, cold-blooded. And, um, and I, I think it's, uh, you can't really practice if, if um, you were to, you know, uh, at some point you have you see all these sick patients around you and uh, you have to have a heart to uh, tolerate all that uh, yeah it's so true I, mean, I think it, it's it's such a difficult balance isn't it I and mean, that's what we're all trying to achieve where you cannot you cannot feel the same emotional toll as a family member or loved one can because if it, your loved one is sick, you can't think. But on the same time, you still have to understand the fears so you can address them. So it's such an interesting balance where you have to be coldly logical, but coldly logical with an understanding of the fears and, 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 and concerns and the pain and the suffering that your patient's dealing with. Yeah, yeah totally agree. I think for only we should maybe limit 
while we're discussing with the patients, just to put briefly our, ourselves in their shoes and try to feel what they're going through. I mean, similarly, when we have uh, like a symptoms of bad disease in our family member, we go, you know, really panic and mm -hmm. start thinking of all the worst case scenarios. And, and that's when you understand how difficult it's for the patients. Uh, but, but yeah. Uh, I like the uh, the saying that you said be nice and work hard and, and I think I think those two really go along together because you can be nice if you don't work hard if you are to work less and put your work on others and, and then you'll become you know try to avoid the work so they really I, I, I completely agree with that um, word um, you know, it's funny it, talk, talking about, you know, I didn't, I didn't talk about burnout at all, but burnout is always the other elephant in the room, right? And my personal philosophy is that burnout doesn't come from working hard. I think as humans, we love to work. We feel fulfilled when we have a mission and a purpose. I think burnout comes from not feeling like your work matter. So being not being valued, not being appreciated, not having a flexibility and autonomy to, to, to do your work. To me, that's the key. You know, so you've got duty hour requirements and this, that, and the other. And I think they're great for many reasons, but I'm not at all surprised that they haven't solved burnout because burnout is a totally separate issue from yeah. duty hour. It's about feeling that you have agency and purpose. So anyway, my two cents and something I hope, I hope my fellows feel, they're the ones that work with me, that they have a mission and a purpose and that their voice matters and that the, all the hard work they put in is, is for a good cause. Yeah, totally agree. Um, no questions so far. I have one question actually with this regards, <laughs> I mean, during residency, I'm sure fellowship is more, um, you know, time, you know, you have constricted time, a lot of work to do. And, and you realize that you don't really get enough time to collect the data from the patient, review the case, and on top of that, try to spend more time. Uh, what do you think are the most important things in our discussion with the patients that we should prioritize if we have less time? What's the... I love that question. That is such an important question. So it's, it's interesting. I actually tend to schedule shorter visits with my patients than many of my colleagues, yet because I believe in quality, not quantity. What do I mean by that? When I see a patient, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, I've reviewed their chart exhaustively in advance. I'm not saying that's fun, but it's necessary. So when I see the patient, I'm not asking them 17 details about their past medical history because I've already got all that information. I ask focus solely on how do you feel now? That's really what, I, and then maybe a few clarifying questions about the past medical history that I need to sort out. And then I go straight to social history. I want to know where everyone's born and raised. Who do you live with at home? How many kids do you have? Because I like that information. It separates them. And then straight to my plan, my assessment and plan for them. And the reason is if you have digested all the important information in advance, you essentially are going to know the plan before you walk into the room. So you can you spend you can spend more time on the stuff that you that you are that you can connect with them about. Second, I find that building rapport and trust quickly is so much more effective if you know about the patient. They feel a sense of calm when they know you've reviewed your records and thought about them. So a hundred percent get everything in advance except ask how they're feeling, ask about their life circumstances. And in advance, because you've done all your prep work, you have formulated a plan to make the visit more efficient. I don't think you need a lot of time to establish an effective bond. I agree. Uh, I think the social, social is really, really the one that make you a good connection with the patient. And they don't actually know that it's a part of the medical question. They think it's, you're just right. being, um, interested in. And yeah, good. Thank you. There is a question here by uh, Dr. Bott. Uh, asking any heart transplant outcome differences among junior versus senior providers? Yeah, it's a great question. I've not seen that data published, and I think people are probably maybe too scared to do that data. There is definitely data on high volume versus lower volume transplant centers. 
and that if you uh, there's clear data to show that larger volume centers have better outcomes when it comes to complicated patients. So I think that data is clear and that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. So, and I think there's probably no question that there's probably some differential expertise of junior versus senior physicians, but I always tell my trainees and when they, and they start their precipice of their career, it doesn't matter if you don't know everything, you just have to know the right questions to ask. I think anyone who's been a junior faculty knows you spend basically your first year terrified and reaching out to your trusted mentors and colleagues very regularly to run through cases and questions. So really, one would hope there isn't a big difference in outcomes, junior versus senior clinicians, because the junior know when to ask for help and who to get it from. It's a team sport. Yeah. Very true. Is there any other questions? Okay, Dr. Donna says it's a beautiful discussion. I think I think it's really uh, totally. Um, I think we should work more on on this um, on this part of medicine to get. Uh, I think comparing to Middle Eastern countries, that the background with, that we come from, where they are more overloaded with the patient. Um, uh, load they basically get to see a five ten minute for each patient and um, see like 50 patients 60 patients a day and I, I realize of course here they give more importance on this kind of discussions but um, but okay. but even yeah. despite that we still do have a very good doctors that the patients appreciate so you can, I agree with the word that you were saying the other uh, um, earlier about the quality versus quantity. I, I, I like just the smile the, in the doctor face and the way he talks, the way he explains everything, just sometimes is enough for the patient um, to acknowledge that. So. Well, you know, I have a, I have a book coming out uh, called Mastering the Art of Patient Care. It'll be published in early 2023. A lot of these tips will be in there. So everyone stay tuned. Chat, you can keep, keep your eyes peeled for a, a publication from Springer, which will have a lot of useful things in it, I hope. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Dr. Kittelson, thank you so much for thank attending uh, and um, for this beautiful discussion and presentation. I think no more questions and thank you everyone for joining our and we're looking forward to seeing you on our future sessions. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. It was wonderful. Bye. Bye.